Welcome to the Strength Connection Podcast, a show to share stories, insights, and experiences from some of the greatest coaches in the world. I'm Michael Krakowski, so grateful for you joining me today. And if you like this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to support the show. All right, let's dive in. Here we go. All right, and we are live. Welcome to the show, everybody. Yuri, thanks so much for taking the time. Really grateful to have you on the show. Yeah, Mike, thanks so much for, for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So it's uh, seeing the work that you've done, not only now, but just really the journey that you've, uh, you know, come from, from early on is really inspiring. I've loved following the work that you're doing. I'm excited to really jam into it and just dive into stuff. So um, to really kick this off, it's like, tell me a little bit about like the beginnings of this journey. Obviously now you've been, you know, best-selling author, you know, really working with helping coaches now really escalate your, um, you know, their businesses. But you had a lot of this personal kind of venture of health early on, like starting at 17. Can you bring mm -hmm. us back to like the beginning of this? When was the first time that you really started focusing on your own health and how did this come about? Yeah, so I was I was active as a, as a, as a teenager. Uh, I, my goal from the age of 10 was to play professional soccer. And I was, it was just kind of like a driving force for a lot of my teenagers. So I was really fit and I was active. But I didn't realize I wasn't healthy until I lost all of my hair in the space of six weeks. And I was like, okay, why did that happen? What's going on here? Because it's not like male pattern baldness. I basically had an autoimmune condition called alopecia. So I lost everything across my whole body. My dad's a Moroccan. So just like a bit of context of how much hair I had before that was, was quite a lot. So that was really the kind of kick in the butt to say, well, all right, let's kind of investigate and kind of figure this out. So went the traditional route because at the time that's all I knew. So I went to the doctors, the, you know, all the, the medical professionals, and I really had no answers. Their answers were like, oh, we can inject our head with cortisone and just keep the inflammation down. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like a good plan. Mm -hmm. So that was my introduction to alternative therapies and, and more of a holistic uh, path. And I spent the next several years with my mom, just going from one practitioner to another to really figure out what could be going on, tried all sorts of different potions and concoctions and Nothing really made a lasting change. Um, so about eight years later, so during this period of time, I eventually was able to play pro soccer for a number of years. Um, but I always had this in the back of my mind because I went to school for kinesiology and then I retired from playing soccer at 24. I went back to school after that to study nutrition, holistic nutrition. And that changed my life because like in the first day I was, <laughs> I was exposed to information and I was like, well, sorry, what? Like what? I never even knew this stuff existed. And all of a sudden I started to change my diet. And when I say change my diet, I mean, just remove the garbage, which wow. I had grown up on for 20 some odd years. And the thing was like, I was exhausted for most of my life. Like I spent 50% of my time sleeping and I thought it was because I was active. I thought it was because I was just tired from playing. And I was like, maybe not. So as I started to have this epiphany around how your body can feel as it starts to kind of clean up, I was jumping out of bed after six, seven hours of sleep. And that was the first, that was the first big epiphany. That was the first time in my life where I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. this is how, this is how it could be. And what was interesting is on the back side of that. And this is after a couple of weeks of cleaning things up, but I'm doing all of this while I'm in nutrition school. So I'm learning this stuff and I'm applying it. And within about six weeks, I regrew all my hair. And I was like, okay, this is, this is amazing. So I, I like immediately I had to start sharing this message. So I actually wrote my New York times bestselling book from the back of nutrition, like from the back of the class in nutrition school, I was piecing this together as I was kind of trying things and, and seeing the results. And obviously like that took another nine years to come into existence, but that's where it started. Obviously I don't have any hair. 10 years later, I got a tetanus shot and whatever help, you know, health hair fell out again. Mm -hmm. Um, but nonetheless, that was really what got me into this whole space. Cause I was like, hold on, like there's a lot of amazing practitioners out there. I was meeting some of these people in my journey. No one knew they existed. They didn't know how to run a business. And I was like, okay, noted. I'm going to bookmark that maybe for later. But most importantly was my journey of the combination of being very active as a, as a teenager, playing pro soccer, then going to school for kinesiology. I was working as a trainer, nutritionist during this whole time. I just wanted to start sharing what I was learning because I started to really enjoy seeing the transformation in other people. And that was really the start of the journey from a kind of a, a career perspective. Um, 
I didn't actually think it was going to go this direction. I actually, my goal was to play pro soccer and then become the medical doctor for a professional soccer team. Mm -hmm. And then for my first year of university, I was like, I don't think I want to do that anymore. <laughs> so I really, really enjoyed working with people. But the problem is that after doing that for seven years, the one-on-one -on -one grind, I was just burnt out. Mm -hmm. And so in my mid, you know, late twenties at that point, um, I started my first online business, had no clue what I was doing. So this is back in 2005, 2006. And I just wanted to share my my message, my knowledge with whoever we would whoever would listen. And at that time, it was no one because I didn't know how to market. I was a very good technical expert, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know how to build a business. And that took me some time to, to get going. But that's really how it all started. And I just wanted to share with a lot of people. I wanted to live a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I just kind of had to go through <laughs> the ups and downs to eventually figure it all out. Yeah. What was that like process, like mindset wise, uh, when you started seeing like hair coming out like that? Like, did you know anybody else who like had something like this or did it feel like you were no. really kind of like, you know, one against the world? Yeah. Like I felt I, it was, it was interesting because I actually didn't, um, a lot of people thought like that must've been really hard. And to be honest, I was like, it was, it was fine to be honest. Like, I think I had a good head on my shoulders from that age. And so I think a lot of other people perceived it being harder than it was for me. Sure. I had a close group of friends who, you know, kind of kept me in check and, and helped me realize it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Like, you know, you're in your senior year of high school, you're walking down the halls, people are seeing you as if you're going through chemo. Like there's obviously those looks, but you know, at the end of the day for me, it was like, well, it could have been like, I mean, people are losing their limbs, mm -hmm. right? They're going through way worse than I'm going through. It's only hair. So for me, it wasn't too bad. Um, so the mindset at the time was, I mean, like there's a lot of people that are going through much worse than I am. Mm -hmm. However, when I lost my hair the second time, so by this point I was 31, um, that was a different story because by that point I had actually built my business online to a pretty substantial point, you know, had hundreds of thousands of followers, pretty good YouTube channels at that time, but 150,000 people, mm -hmm you know, like all this stuff. And I'm this health expert who now is like losing his hair again. And I'm like, and I kept my head shaved the whole time. But so when I say my hair, like, I mean, my eyebrows and the whole bit. Sure. Yeah. So what I, what I ended up doing for the next two years when this happened was I actually painted on fake eyebrows with my wife's makeup every single day, just to cover up the fact that I was going through this again. Cause sure. I was ashamed at this point to think, well, what if, who is this health guy who's now like, you know, not really right. healthy supposedly. And that was, that was between the two, the first time losing my hair and the second time, the second time was way worse because right. the, the, the meaning I gave to it was what are people going to think of me? I'm an imposter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it took me two years to like, I, I didn't want to go swimming with my kids. I didn't want to work out because I could sweat it off and all this nonsense. Right. And two years later, I eventually got to the point where I'm like, I'm going to take this veil of shame off this mask. Mm. And I'm just going to like say, screw it. Like, this is who I am, you know? And like, and that's it. So that was a very interesting time in my life. And that was probably the most challenging to be honest, because of, I guess for me, I had more to lose than when I initially lost it, like lose, not, not the hair, but obviously credibility, all the yeah. stuff I had built, you know, supposedly worrying about what other people think. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting, uh, interesting moment, but I'm happy I went through it because, you know, I learned a lot in the process. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that about the second time was so much worse as an adult, because you think yeah. when you're an adult, you have so much more of a sense of identity, maybe, and you know who you are, you're more comfortable in your skin versus a 17 year old who we naturally think like has no idea. Like, so that would seem like maybe just on, on the surface, a more traumatizing time to go through it. But it seemed just at 17, you know, it was just kind of like, okay, like this is the process. We'll go figure it out. Going back to that beginning time with those conversations with doctors and kind of going to see what were those conversations like? Were they very just kind of like, yeah, like, don't worry about it. Like, was it really like short? What was that process like? It was, it would be like going to the car mechanic and be like, Hey, I have this problem with my engine. And they're like, well, we don't know what's going on, but we can just like hammer some stuff and see what happens. That yeah. was pretty much the conversation. It was like, we don't know why this is happening but we can give you a band-aid, which is not like in, in my case would have been cortisone injections into my head. Mm -hmm. I never really made sense of that. So I was like, well, I don't really want needles in my head. This doesn't sound like a sustainable solution. 
And I really wasn't getting any, like whether it was, you know, like immunologists or RGP or whatever. And it, it started to really create a divide in my mind about the whole system in general. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that was like my first real fork in the road of maybe the system. When I say the system, I call, I now call it the medical matrix. Like I think, you know, I live in Canada, obviously the system's a disaster, but that was kind of my first real, oh, like maybe the system is good because two years prior to that, I broke my leg playing soccer, mm -hmm. went to the hospital, got a cast. Awesome. Acute care. Great. Chronic issues horrible. Yeah. And I, th I think I had the juxtaposition to be like, Oh, now I see the difference. You know, it took me, um, two hours in the waiting room to get a cast on. It took me eight years and no answers with the medical system to figure out what was going on here. I started to see a really big contrast in the system. And so that was really a big motivating factor for me to really want to dive in and, and kind of become a detective in my own, my own health journey. Mm -hmm. And then I just figured a lot of people, weren't privy to this information. Cause I'm like, if I went to one of the top schools in the world, I played pro soccer and I still didn't know this stuff. There's gotta be the majority of the world who doesn't either. And that just right. became my mission to want to share this with as many people as possible. Yeah. That's such an important distinction that you said about the medical matrix. I like that, uh, you know, um, analogy right there. Cause it yeah. is, it's, you know, there's a lot of good things in technology and advancements that they've done, but it's mostly on the reactive side of things. Like something traumatic happens, they save your life. We're really good at that. Um, yeah. Or like you break your leg. Absolutely. There's a very set criteria of how you can do this. But with so many people who are suffering from chronic issues, you know, things that are, you know, on the proactive side of it, we're still so far behind from there. And you kind of got the first, you know, you got a front row seat of going into this. Was that like a, was that like a, like a slow process that you started to see it over and over again? Or was there like any specific time when you're like, no, this system's really fucked in some way. Like there's, there's a huge distinction going on here. I mean, I think there was a multitude of events, mm -hmm. right? So like there was that for myself, um, like seeing what people in my family or, you know, one degree of separation we're going through, chronically, like if it was like a diabetes type of situation or someone with like prostate cancer or, mm -hmm. and just starting to see like, just in conversation with them or hearing through story, how ineffective the whole process was. I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, like yeah. you have someone who has type two diabetes going to the hospital and they're in the way they're in the room and they're getting fed jello white bread, like ridiculous. I'm like, how does this even make sense? Mm -hmm. So I just started to see one thing after another where the dominoes started to fall. And I was like, this is really not making a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at even like, obviously when I went back to school to study nutrition, I was so blown away by even the whole idea of uh, like margarine, right? Like back in the day, margarine was brought to the, brought to the, to the market as like this savior for heart health, even, but like for most people who don't understand how, uh, fats operate in the body, right? They think butter is terrible and now obviously margin is a savior. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like these, these altered and these plastics and these like man-made chemicals and foods mm -hmm. are the very cause of a lot of these health issues, right? And you look at the amount of money we've raised for heart disease and cancer, and they're still the two top leading causes of death. It's like, we're not, what we're doing isn't working, mm -hmm. right? And we're, we're like, it's just a very ineffective model. So it's interesting too, because with, with Healthpreneur, like the current business I run, we help health professionals build their coaching businesses. And a lot, I would say 98% of our, of our clients are on the fringe of the medical matrix, or they've been in it and they're like, screw this. I'm out mm -hmm. of this. I can't deal with this nonsense anymore. And that's really cool because we're working with like root cause doctors, people who get to the root cause of these mm -hmm. issues to really help their clients transform their health. And that's super rewarding. So it's actually, it's interesting because for a health-based company, although we're kind of a business mentorship company, we're helping health professionals, like our, our common enemy is the system. Like the system that like everyone has been brought up into and educated through and all the nonsense. And it's like, that's the system we're fighting to some degree because it's not effective and there's way better ways of doing that. So. Our goal is to shine the light on the amazing practitioners who are doing the real good work in the world and uh, who really are helping people get to the root of their issues, solve them once and for all. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It's such an interesting conversation on that. I want to ask you more about that. Going back to 
like the early days again, you said you were sleeping like 50% of the time on there. Is yeah. that a, is that a symptom of alopecia and everything else that you were experiencing? I don't know if it's a symptom, but it was, it was an interesting correlation that I made. So as I started to learn about, um, so as I'm going through nutrition school, I'm starting to learn about all this stuff mm -hmm. and how the body, you know, it takes, a, there's a lot of energy for digestion and sort of learn about immunity and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm like, huh, okay, so maybe I'm so tired because my body is spending all of its energy fighting shit inside my body. Mm -hmm. And then I started to look at, you know, like obviously over time and kind of piecing things together, I created a, a correlation, at least in my own body, and then seeing this in other people too, where generally people who are very tired, it's a warning sign that something far more dangerous is brewing underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was... I was tired all the time. And then it was like, okay, my body's like, okay, dude, it's not that you need more sleep. It's just the body we, this body is exhausted from having to deal with all the nonsense you're giving it. So if you're not getting this message, we're going to give you something a little bit more, you know, right. concrete <laughs> to deal with. But the thing is like, I wasn't tired because I was playing soccer. I was tired yeah. because I was eating shreddies in the morning with two tablespoons of sugar and cow's milk. And then laying on my bed because I had so much gas in my stomach and I would do that over and over and over without ever piecing the two together. Like not recognizing how the very foods I was eating was destroying my health and starting to recognize, oh, why am I, why am I having to take a nap after having a bagel? Mm -hmm. Never really piecing those two things together. And so it took me a long time, obviously, as I started to learn about this stuff to recognize, well, okay, so if I feel tired, it's not because I'm exhausted physically. It's just because the foods that I'm eating are just mm -hmm. requiring so much of my body from a digestive and honestly, like a frontline immunity perspective to even deal with. What if I got rid of that stuff? And what if I just gave my body just normal food? Like that was from planet earth. And it wasn't like I, like it's, it's not rocket science. Like, I mean, it's the stuff that everyone talks about, you right. more whole foods, more plant-based stuff, whatever. And it was just like a, like a switch. And all of a sudden within like, I'm telling you within like a week, yeah. I felt like a new person and it was just incredible. So yeah. 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 That's yeah. It's so crazy how quickly you saw results after doing this, after like an eight year span of struggling with this during that time frame, was there a thought in your mind or anybody even put like a, a nugget of this into your like head about like, maybe it's the nutrition side or was that not even really a thought in there because i assume like you're still playing high level soccer like still yeah. working so maybe it's an easy rationalization to be like well i'm still performing at a high level so obviously something's okay going on here but was that even a thought in those early days not really like honestly it was i i remember the moment like i remember going to an open house for the nutrition school that i ended up going to and it was I don't know, a 90 minute open house and i'm sitting in the class and the stuff they're talking about around like cholesterol as an example I was blown away. I'm like, sorry, how have I never even heard about this stuff before? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, so as I obviously went through nutrition school, the professors who I was learning from, who were naturopathic doctors, functional medicine doctors, mm -hmm. those are the people that really started getting me thinking about, oh my God, like, so the very foods I could be eating could be part of this whole thing. And the fact that my body is maybe a toxic wasteland could be part of this problem. And so those were really the, I would say the first mentors that really got me thinking about this in a very different way, because when I was, I was playing soccer in France uh, previous to that, and I would have games on like a Saturday or Sunday, I'd have crepes with Nutella for breakfast. I'd have like shawarma or a kebab and fries after the game. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's like a <laughs> daily occurrence, right? I'd walk down to the bakery and get a whole baguette. I'm living by myself, right? A whole mm -hmm. baguette, even if it's on a daily basis having pasta with cream sauce and like once in a while, whatever, but like on a daily and I'm like, I have no clue about this stuff. Yeah. And so I can only imagine had I known this pre like prior to playing soccer. I mean, I think my body would have felt a lot better during the process. Yeah. Oh man. Crepes with Nutella. I'm getting tired. Just thinking about that. Just <laughs> crushing that. It, it is. It's funny. Like, you know, in, in a young body, right. It's like, you can get away with a little bit more stuff on this, but then as you said, sometimes you don't even recognize that you're not feeling good until you actually change it over and realize, holy shit, I can actually feel like really energized just by switching this over. And just yep. this process then of just six weeks 
all of a sudden your hair is growing back there. What was that like for you in your mind? Like all of a sudden, like your hair starts sprouting back again. Was that like a, a crazy, like, holy shit moment? Like, where has this been all my life? Yeah, totally. It was actually really interesting because I was like, I'm like, well, what do I do with this? My eyebrows are growing in, but they look really weird. So I still had to like shave them a little bit just so they could like eventually grow in normally. Um, but it was, it was crazy. Like, and, and I started to like, that's the type of thing where you start to really think about, like, well, what's going on here? What's different? And you start thinking, well, the only thing that's been different is, is that and that. So I'm like, well, if I just kept doing this, like, what does that all look like? Yeah. And so that was just incredible. Like, it, it's, it's really cool to, you know, whether we're talking about helping people on their health or even in their business, when, when someone's gone through a journey of repeated failures and they don't think anything else can work, and all of a sudden something does, it's a really interesting moment where you're like, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like eight years of no answers and then almost complete remission in six weeks. It's like, well, you, you become a true believer at that point. It's like, wow, like there's obviously something I was not privy to in terms of knowing or doing for a long time. And I think that's really, for me, again, it's just, it, it became such a compelling process to go through that I was like, I just have to share this with as many people as possible. Like my, my mess became my message. Yes. Right. And I just knew it became, I tell people like losing my hair was the best thing that ever happened for me because it, it allowed me to, to kind of like get onto this tra trajectory of what I'm doing now, which I'm, I absolutely love, you know, what I've been doing for the past 20 plus years. And I don't know if I'd be on the same journey had this not happened. Mm -hmm. And so part of the other, like the other reason I love working with health professionals is because most of us have all gone through some health challenge, right? Sure. Like a lot of, you know, trainers that I know were a little bit heavier as kids and they went on this like bender to get in better shape. And then they just wanted to share that with other people. And I think it's just so cool to, to come from that place of your own quote unquote suffering and then want to help yourself. And then obviously want to help others with that. And I think that's, you know, for me, it's been really inspiring and obviously being able to help others do that is, has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I think everybody who really goes into the coaching world has some sort of personal message like that. You know, I always think of it, it's like, all of a sudden, you found this door and you open it up. And there's just this huge world in here. It's like Willy yeah. Wonka's chocolate factory. And all of a sudden, you're like, holy shit, what else do these doors open up here? But it is it's everybody has like that initial buy in. And oftentimes it is it's not like this long, arduous process of going in. Usually it's relatively quick. It's like all of a sudden three, four weeks of doing something different and seeing that immediate buy-in. Now you're like, oh my gosh, like I feel so good. And that's why I think so many people go in and just want to share this message with other people. So when you were studying, you studied kinesiology and then you went into nutrition and then all of this happened here. When you first got into nutritional studies, was it a thought in your mind at that point of like, maybe this is something that could help me? Or was it just, I just want to explore this more at that time? It was interesting. I actually had no thought of that in the first place. So I was, um, my, my then girlfriend is not my wife. We actually went to nutrition school together. So this is kind of like in the first year of our relationship, we're like, Hey, this would be cool. Cause she was studying. She was just finishing up her studies at the university of Toronto and I was training clients at this time. And I thought this would be amazing to help my clients with. Mm -hmm. I had no thought that this was something I could use. And then it just became the complete opposite. I was like, oh my mm -hmm. God, like, what if I tried this? And then obviously I incorporated it with a lot of my clients and it made a huge difference. So yeah, it really wasn't for me. It was more of like, I think this could really help my clients. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So after that, you said you worked for a little bit, like, you know, some in-person work of getting in and then shifted pretty quickly to online. It was like some burnout uh, that was going on in there. What was the, what was the reason? Cause you're a pretty early adopter into the online coaching base world, you know, at that yeah. point, what was yeah. the thought process behind going more of the virtual route from what you were doing before? So I started training clients when I was in school. So mm -hmm. I was working as a trainer slash nutritionist, probably all in all about seven years. Mm -hmm. And I really, really enjoyed seeing people change and improve and get fit. It was amazing. But I remember toward the latter stages of, of those years, spending a lot of my time working with a client and looking at my watch. And mm -hmm. I was like, what, like, is this over yet? You know, mm -hmm. um, I remember at one point I was driving to a client's condo to train them in their gym. And I was like six o'clock in the morning, I shoveled my car out of the snow because I had street parking at the time. 
and we were living in this like small apartment, like 800 square feet, top of the house type of thing. I drive across the whole city, which, you know, like Toronto is kind of like New York in the sense of it's just really busy. And I get to their condo at six in the morning, park in the underground garage, and I'm sitting in my car looking at the concrete wall in the underground. I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. Like, this is, this is not by choice. This is by like, I have to do this. And I don't really enjoy this feeling. Like I loved working with my clients. It's just, it wasn't by choice. It was by necessity. Mm -hmm. And that became, um, a really thing, a really like that became kind of like a midlife crisis in my twenties that I started to deal with. And then I was uh, saving up. I remember in 2006, my, again, my, my now wife, then girlfriend were, planning a trip to Europe for six weeks. So I spent months, 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 just like working my butt off to make all this money so we could go on this trip. And I remember going on the trip, we had a great time, but I remember every single time we'd have lunch or grab a coffee, that money was going down and mm -hmm. nothing else was coming in. And that was the moment where I'm like, I never, ever, ever want to experience this again because I felt so scarce mm -hmm. and it was not a good feeling to feel. So... At the time I was working with a coach more on like mindset stuff and we'd meet every two weeks or so, just a quick, you know, 20 minute call. And I don't even know how it came up, but he said something like, why don't like, why don't you just like set up a website or something? And I don't even know where the seed was initially planted for online. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember. It's been so long, but that's kind of how it started. And I said, listen, I don't even know, like, I, mean, I don't even know how to set up a website. It's like, well, like I know someone who can maybe help. So I was like, cool. So we set up this website. Um, who knows what I was doing? I didn't know. No one found it obviously because it's just like, uh, just a website out there. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it, it, but at least we started at least like something was started and then it just sat there. And then I had, um, a client I was working with at the time who were working out and he said something that changed my life. He said, why don't you put your voice on tape? And I thought to myself, what, what does that even mean? Now, for context, this is just when the first iPod had come out. So not iPhone, but like iPod. And I thought to myself, I'm like, huh. So I, we started talking and I was like, well, all right. So then I was like, what is, I'm, I'm trying to think of like, what, is, what does that even mean? But then eventually that became the seed for my first online program, where essentially I took two weeks off at Christmas. So again, I said, I'm not going to make any money because I'm not trading time for money. I'm going to, okay, whatever. I'm going to build the dream. And I remember sitting in my apartments and I opened up my laptop and I recorded uh, 12 weeks worth of workouts into GarageBand. Mm -hmm. And it was the way I thought about this was it's as if I was working with a client in person and I was walking them through step by step every aspect of the workout. Mm -hmm. So audio cues for, you know, a uh, good technique and how to activate the muscles and encouragement and all that kind of stuff. And it was awesome. The challenge is that when it was done, Again, no one knew it existed because I didn't know how to get the message out online. Right. But at the minimum, I could give that to my clients in person so they could use that in between our sessions. Mm. And I started to see how much of a difference it was making for them. And I was like, this is pretty cool. So that was my first product online. Mm -hmm. And it was also a really important process because it was the first time I ever even thought about how to productize my service, which became a really important part of my thinking for the next 20 years mm -hmm. because that created a tremendous amount of leverage um, because eventually that product started to, you know, after about three years of struggle online, mm -hmm. uh, eventually started to understand how to get it out there and how to sell it. And that became uh, a really cool process. But again, you know, I think those first three years online, you know, like they were unnecessarily hard for me because I try to do everything by myself uh -huh. and that was a big mistake. And it's the biggest mistake I tell people to avoid. I'm like, I understand if you don't think you have the money, but the reality is you don't have the time, yeah. you know, because I can't get those three years back, but I've made more than enough money to make up for it, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's one thing. Again, I don't like, I don't live with regrets. I don't regret anything, but if there's anything I could change, it would definitely be going back in time and saying, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Let me find someone who does. And let me just kind of like ride on their coattails. Yeah. So that's kind of how it started. Yeah. My favorite quotes, I forget the name and who uh, coined it, but the trouble is you think you have time 
And it's like, it's always stuck with me on that. If you always think like, yeah, I've got plenty of time to do this. It's like, no, yeah. you've got today. And that's it. At that time, was it because you were like an early adopter? This was kind of a brand new thing, like really getting into websites. As you saw, like the first iPod, you know, was just getting started at there. Was it more of your own mindset of like, I, I'm just going to do this, you know, myself, I, I can figure this out myself. Or was there not really anybody out there that you knew who like even understood this world yet that you could even go to right now? There's you know, a lot of different people that, you know, help coaches, you know, build this up now. So it's much more popularized right now. I think COVID had a lot to do with that. But back yeah. then we're talking about, you know, almost 20 years ago from here. What was that process like, uh, you know, for you at that point? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's twofold. I think number one is, uh, I guess I'm, I, I think of myself as a pretty smart guy. It's also a challenge that a lot of health professionals deal with. It's like they're smart, which is also their Achilles heel because they think they can figure things out. And I, I was that person. I'm like, oh, I could figure this out now. So that was the first. And the second thing was, I think this is before social media too. So there, what the visibility that we have nowadays of every fourth post, you have someone else like, you know, I can be your business mentor, didn't exist. So unless you actively sought out stuff using as like search, which this is actually even before Google, I think this is like some, I mean, I don't even, it was Netscape. I think that was where, you know, where we were at the time. But it was all SEO. It was all search. That's pretty much mm -hmm. what was going on. Google ads eventually became, you know, uh, the predominant thing around that time. But I, I didn't have the visibility of like, who else does this stuff? And then, again, I'm trying to remember how it came about. But my one of my earlier mentors was Yannick Silver, who's an awesome human. And he ran an event for several years in a row called the Underground Online underground online summit or seminar. And what he would do is he would bring together speakers who knew what, who no one knew, but who were crushing it online. And again, I can't remember. And I wish I remember how I kind of came into mm -hmm. that ecosystem, but after consuming some of the information uh, that he was putting out by email and so forth and not really doing anything in terms of like seeking mentorship in 2009, end of 2009, I sat down and I was reviewing my year and I'm like, dude, you got to do something different. It's been three years. We're not like, you're not where you want to be. You're hiding behind your computer. And like, we're not really making much progress. And I said, okay, next year, 2010, what can I do that I haven't done? And that first commitment was just go to some live events. And Yannick had an event coming up the couple months after that. Uh, Ryan Lee was another uh, OG, if you will, mm -hmm. who is another awesome human who had an event at the time. Uh, first, you know, quarter of 2010. And so I said, I'm just, I have to go to these events. I don't know what to expect, but I know I have to be there because if, if I keep doing what I'm doing, it's not going to work. So let's just try this and see what happens. And so I set the intention of going to the events and set the intention that I would also find a coach because at that point I'm like, all right, like I just got to do this. So those two events were uh, absolutely pivotal in my journey. Um, you know, I, at the time, more or less met everyone in the online health and fitness space, which was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. To meet guys that were doing seven and eight figures at the time, this is 2010, off of eBooks. I was, I'm like, how is this even possible? Right. And to see how they weren't smarter than me. Some of them didn't even have university degrees. But I'm like, if they can figure this out, like I can do this too. And so just being in that soup started to raise my level of belief of like what was possible. And then most, I think just as important was to start to actually build those relationships. Like these were no longer just people I happened to see online or didn't even know exist. These eventually became some of my closer friends. And, you know, I'm talking about guys that, you know, I was in their wedding parties, we traveled together over the next couple of years. So that initial a decision to attend those events was so pivotal because that's really the uh, like the inflection point from which everything else cascaded. And at one of the events, uh, you know, I, I saw someone speak from stage and I was like, I just basically stalked them afterwards. And I just said, Hey man, like I need you to be my coach. I mm -hmm. don't know what you offer, but I, I know this is the right direction. And so that became just like that year was like the transformation for, for myself personally and for the business because I started to learn about actually how to build a business, like how to build these skills. And again, just being surrounded by other people who were on the same path as well as further ahead. Mm -hmm. And that was just uh, like immeasurable in terms of its uh, impact on me. Yeah. 
it's such an important message of, you know, leveraging time, you know, and just getting help in this. I think it's interesting specifically in the coaching world, really in health and fitness too. And I've thought about this because, you know, to become a fitness coach or even get in, there's really very little barrier to entry. You know, if you start working out yourself, if you start taking care of your health, you can do a lot of stuff on your own and yeah. get some good results personally. And that thought process can very easily start to trickle into other things. Oh, well, if I figure this out, I can figure the business side out, or I can figure out the marketing side or even how to you know, coach somebody. It's almost a, it's a tough trap that people fall into where a lot of other vocations, you have to go in, you're getting taught by teachers. You need to get education on it, where this is a very different industry where a lot of people just go from their own pulling up their own boots and just doing some work on there. And I've yeah. seen so many people, myself included for a long time thinking, oh, I can just, I can figure this out. I can just get it till eventually, just like you did of like that, you know, six to eight weeks, you know, with your nutritional, uh, with your nutritional change on there after eight years of struggle, often just getting in with a good coach or even just a good group of people, all of a sudden in four weeks, you can start to see that growth that you've been looking for over years afterwards, but I'm sure with the work that you do of working with, with coaches, have you seen this a lot from like young coaches that are coming in that you're working with? Like, what are the main struggles that you are seeing with like coaches coming in who want to scale their business, who want to reach out to more people? Is it kind of similar to your process or is it something a little bit different? Yeah, to be honest, I think everyone goes through the same journey. I, I think there are very few people who right out of the gate, like it's like almost it's like, imagine being born. And then as soon as you're born, seeking mentorship on how to help you walk. Like, it's almost like you have to struggle a lot in order to realize I can't walk on my own. I need to get some help. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a fairly consistent journey across the board because I think most of us are like, okay, let me figure this out on my own for a bit. And then it's like, try this, didn't work. Try that, didn't work. Hit my head against the wall. Okay, after a certain amount of time, you hit your rock bottom. You're like, I can't keep doing this. Now let me seek out help it's very hard to help people who are not open to being helped. Mm -hmm. And very often the people who need your help the most often want it the least. And that's a weird, that took me a while to really recognize because I'm like, oh, there's all these people suffering with their health. Why don't they want my help? Meanwhile, there's people that are seemingly healthy and fit who are willing to invest in coaching and all this kind of stuff because the, there's the type of person who values growth because mm -hmm. they're already, they have momentum in that direction. So what's interesting in what I've seen with health professionals and coaches is it it's almost the mindset as well. And I find this really interesting is most of the health professionals and like health professionals. So I'm talking about, you know, practitioners here, they'll, they'll invest like two, $300,000 and four, six, eight, 10 years of their life in school. And then when they come out, they think they're going to grow their business for free. Like it is just incredible how like the mindset is, well, it's not in my budget to invest a little bit of myself and my business. I'm like, was it in your budget to invest $300,000 for a piece of paper that gave you technical skills and no business acumen? Yeah. It's so weird how we think of this, like this formal education as it's okay to do that, but no one in the right mind would invest $300,000 in business mentorship, like on day one of their business. But if you think about this, like we'll talk with a chiropractor, for, like a lot of chiropractors will come into our world and they're like, Hey, how do I like, how do I do this stuff online? I'm like, well, I can't tell you that because you're the expert, but we can show you processes and frameworks. Mm -hmm. And there's so much disbelief, uh, whether it's a manual therapist, like a chiropractor or a physical therapist, whatever. But the question I asked them is like, did you know how to adjust spines before you went to chiropractic college? And everyone is like, no. And it's like, well, that's the same thing here. That's why we exist. You went mm -hmm. to school to learn how to adjust and do your thing. And now you're in a position where you don't know how to make the transi transition online at least. And that's why we think of us as a chiropractic college for business, mm -hmm. right? And it's almost like they're looking for all this certainty and all these guarantees before they even start. Even though when they had no money and no experience and they went to school, they had none of that. Because of this like story we've all been led to believe about formal education and how you get this piece of paper on the wall and then you're going to have this successful business, but you don't. So a lot of the clients we work with who are practitioners, they're coming into working with us buried in debt. We're talking about student debt that's been on the balance sheet for 10 plus years. They're burnt out. 
they bought into a model that was trading time for money and they're sick and tired of it. So what's interesting is trying to see like where some people are at with their mindset around understanding the importance of investing in business or coaching so they can get out of that. Um, whereas some people just have to keep struggling on their own for a while to get to that point where they're like, you know what, maybe I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And so there's, to your point, like there's the low barrier to entry of becoming a coach or a fitness expert, which for sure, like that's obviously a thing. But ironically, on the flip side is you have people who have a high barrier to entry, right? 10 plus years in school, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested. And many of them are as reluctant as the, I think I can do this on my own type of coach to actually invest in business. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, seeing a, an article years ago in a, um, I think it was a chiropractic magazine. So they had pulled thousands of chiropractors and they said, where are you investing your dollars over the next 12 months? And there's like 12 options. So it was like continuing education, devices for the clinic, all this kind of stuff. So number one was certifications and continuing education. And this is the same in every single vertical. I don't care who it is. It could be naturopaths, functional medicine, health coaches. It's the yep. same thing because it's safe. Yeah. And we think that if we get more letters behind our name, that's going to make us better, whatever. <laughs> the very bottom of the list was marketing and business. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, like this is, this is the issue, right? And a lot of health professionals become successful in spite of themselves. And that's also the problem. It's like, if you have a clinic or even a gym, people know, like they can see it. They walk down the street. They're like, oh, there's a clinic. They can type it into Google Maps. Online, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So you can become, you can grow a, a significant brick and mortar practice being a complete dunce from a business perspective because people fall into your lap. They refer other people. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you go online, that doesn't exist because no one sees, no one knows you exist. Like you're obscure to almost everyone. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a tremendous lack of trust. So if someone walks into a clinic or a gym, they're 80% sold just because you have the physical proximity. Right. And yeah. Trust. That is the big, the biggest barrier to building a successful online business is the lack of trust that humans have with people they haven't physically been in proximity with. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very important piece to success online is how do you bridge that gap? Because if people don't see you, they don't know you exist. If they see you once in a while, that doesn't build a lot of trust. And even if they have a Zoom conversation with you, like, how do I know I can trust you? Mm -hmm. But if you walk into a doctor's office for the first time, it's the same thing. How do I, like, I just saw you for the first time, yeah. but because we're in someone's physical presence, now they're real. And there's just like this legitimacy that we don't have online to the same degree. So I think those are the things that we've noticed. Those are the things that we've seen. And I think um, a big piece of that is really lengthening your time horizon for when you set a goal, just like add a couple more years to it. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people get disillusioned. They're like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, bringing clients on left, right, and center. It's like, eh, maybe, maybe not. But like, it's, it's, it's a tricky ride, especially online. It's, I would say it's a lot harder to build an online business than it is in person, but it's a thousand percent more worthwhile. You just have to buckle up. Yeah. There's so much gold that you just uh, brought in there, Yuri. I want to pull in a couple threads there. So it's because the mindset of it is so interesting of investing in yourself after a formal education and where that, where that mindset is of, I'm like, is it scarcity mindset? Is it investment fatigue of like, I just did all this stuff and now I have to invest more. I just had a conversation with my coach uh, just a few weeks ago talking about this. Like if you want to, you know, if you want to build a business of X, Y, Z, but you're only investing this much right here, those numbers don't match. Like you have to match those numbers up from there. But I never thought of it that way. If you said like, yeah, if you just have a brick and mortar space, like You've just you've built just a little bit of environment that naturally builds trust because now all of a sudden, oh, they have a door, they have a bath, they have a mat, they have a secretary in here. They got to be doing something right in there. It just naturally builds that trust. But the online world is like the wild, wild west in there. Like it takes a lot more time. And I had a conversation just this weekend with somebody who was asking me about online coaching. And they said, do you think it's easier to scale? I was like, I'm like, it takes more time in there mm -hmm. in many different ways. I was in that thought process when I started my business online coaching. Like, oh, it's like, you know, it's not as many touch points. It's going to be a lot easier to build, you know, business. No, like it's a lot more work, especially on the beginning stages than the in-person because you've got a built-in appointment with somebody where you're there in front of you for 30 minutes with their undivided attention. 
Now it's like, you've got to get your touch points from there, you know, at all different spots and make sure they're doing the right things uh, from there. So how do you yeah. work? Like, what's the process that, you know, you would give people like who are at that beginning stage, maybe they've got their education, they've done okay in certain different spots, but now they want to go into the online spaces. Yeah. What's the first things that you look at as far as helping them build their structure up? So there's a couple, I mean, we're big on systems. So we we help our clients attract leads, convert clients, deliver results. The two biggest things people come to us for is, Yuri, how do we get more clients? And two is once I have those clients, how do I work with them in a way that's not necessarily one-on-one? So I have more time in my life. So we help on the acquisition and delivery side. And there's on the acquisition front, there's really two ways of doing things. You can do the free way, monetarily free, kind of, or the paid way. So I have a different perspective than a lot of other coaches or business people out there. Um, if someone is in a position where they are open-minded enough and in a position where they can invest in ads from day zero, I would prefer they do that. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because using organic free content is amazing. I'm a huge fan of it. My whole first business largely was built on that. But for, for context, like it took me seven years to make my first million dollars in that business. When I started Health Burner, we made our first million dollars in seven weeks because we were using paid traffic. So mm -hmm. ads, webinar, phone call, that's essentially the, the funnel we built. And it's also what we help our clients install into their businesses. So the danger with that is if you try doing that without expert guidance, it would be like driving a supercar if you don't even have a driver's license, which is not a good idea, right? So I think it depends. So we have two entry points. So a lot of our clients who, let's say, are very wet behind the ears, they don't have a lot. The most important thing, let me just backtrack. The most mm -hmm. important thing for the paid piece to make sense is experience, mm -hmm. is track record, is being a true expert. Because here's how this plays out. You run ads, people eventually book a call with you. You're on the phone with someone who's never heard of you until a couple moments ago. And now you're going to sell them a high ticket coaching package. If you are not the best at what you do, there is no way they're saying yes to that. Mm -hmm. And if you are the type of person who doesn't have an extensive track record behind you to invest money in ads to get people on calls with you and not having the confidence or conviction or them having the belief with you, it's a very fast way to go bankrupt mm -hmm. because like, so the flip side is let's say you don't have as much of a track record. You're, you're, you're like, you're trying to get your first couple clients. Cool. Don't do that. Right. You have to play the game of using your time. You have to get out there. You have to start maybe getting some beta tester clients, getting some social proof, getting track record. And that's going to be a little bit of a grind. Like it is what it is. Like, what else are you going to do? You're going right. to like wave some signs on the side of a road, like use social, put content out there, connect with people. And yeah, it's going to take a little bit of your time, but you have to earn your stripes, mm -hmm. right? What you lack in expertise, you just have to make up in time. Yeah. And once you're at a point where you're like, you know what, I'm amazing at solving this one problem and I have no problem charging two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 to help someone with that, regardless of what your business revenue is at, it's like, cool, maybe consider paid traffic at that point. Because the big thing is what happens in the conversation. If you cannot get people to enroll with you, you know, because you don't have the experience and have yeah. belief in you, that mm -hmm. becomes a really a risk factor, if you will. So for us, it's more about if you're beginning from a, I don't have as much of a track record working with paying clients, I would suggest using a little bit more of the content game, the social game, and just using your time initially to do it well. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who has a lot more track record, so like a lot of our clients will come from their brick and mortar, 20 plus years experience. Cool. Let's, let's just get you dialed. We call it the perfect client pipeline which is more the ad side of things because they don't, they have more money than they have time. Right. Even though they're not rolling in dough, but they just understand like, if I get the right people on the call, I will convert a good percentage of them. So for me, that's kind of the way I look at things is, um, but a lot of coaches out there, they'll say never run ads since you're making 20, 30 K a month. I'm like, how long is that going to take? Mm -hmm. You might be at this for years before you get there. So, right. you know, a lot of our clients coming in, no one knows who they are. They don't have an online presence, but they're experts. And so we can help them go from zero to where they want to be very quickly. But if you're not an expert yet, you have, you have, there's no way around that. Like you, you have to earn your stripes. Yeah.
Yeah. It's like building a restaurant. Like if you don't have that recipe down in there, like it doesn't matter how many people you get into the door. If your food sucks, like totally. you're not going to build that afterwards. I think it's interesting because like so many people will hear a oh, million dollars in seven weeks and forget that it was took seven years for the other million dollars on there. And that experience oh, yeah. is just like, you can't, you know, you can, the only way that you can earn that is just by doing it and just getting it. It's just like going into a health and fitness journey. Like you just, you have to put the time into it and just get those reps in there. And then eventually, then you get down to the line where, all right, now you've got that experience, you know how to navigate and adjust things very quickly from there. Yeah. But it only comes with the experience of coming in. Well, so I was telling my kids, we were at the soccer field playing the other day and I was like, uh, ironically, they're not very flexible and they're only what, like, I've got four, the oldest one's 13 and they can barely touch their toes. And now when they're kids, obviously it's a very different story. Like when they're a lot younger and I was like, Hey guys, the only time I was ever sidelined in soccer was when I broke my leg. I never had a musculoskeletal injury outside of that. No sprained ankles, nothing. And I attribute a lot of that to the foundation that I had built. A lot of the strength and conditioning, a lot of the body weight work, a lot of the calisthenic, a lot of the proprioception work I did. And it's kind of like this, like, yeah, like you will go generally, like your first business takes time. Like you have to build the foundation. You have to go through the mindset work. You have to go through all the shit you have to go through, whether it's that business down the road or a second business afterwards, this, the next thing usually grows a lot faster because you have that foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just, you can't avoid that. I mean, like you have to go through that journey no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Yuri, listen, I really enjoy talking to you. I really appreciate the time. I, I love the work that you're doing and just the journey that you've gone on here from the personal side and taking this mission into everything that you're doing now into helping other people. I think this is awesome. So again, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you, Mike. Absolutely. Great. If people want to check out more of your work, books, everything that you've got going on with Healthpreneur, what's the best place that we can send them? So the two best places are, one is our YouTube channel. Uh, we post at least twice a week and I just put everything out there. I don't hold anything back. It's at Healthpreneur. I've got hundreds of videos on there from everything around mindset, marketing, how to coach clients, sales, the whole thing. Um, and then second is on Instagram. So if you want to hit me up, I'm at health printer. Um, just tell me, you saw me on the show here and, uh, happy to hook you up with anything we can to support you as you guys are building your coaching business too. Perfect. So Yuri, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. Listeners. Thank, thank you, you so much. Go follow Yuri, check the show notes and I'll catch you guys on the next one. All right. Peace. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found some great value here. And if you like this episode, please drop a comment and leave us a five-star rating and review. It does more to build the show than you can imagine. And do not forget to check out and join the Strength Connection Facebook group. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations, as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. It's, this group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength, and it's the perfect space to explore new ideas and to share your journey. And you'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into the physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. So do not wait. Go now. Seriously, go. I right, much love to you. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you on the next one.